Church, my academic pursuits continued this week. For our visitors, last week I shared with our congregation the wonderful opportunities that I had to sit at the feet of scholars in the prior week, including a lecture titled Decolonial Theology from an Indigenous Perspective by Native American scholar Reverend Randy Woodley, PhD, through Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary Center for Ecological Regeneration. I say all of those words because I want you to hear them. Followed by the University of Chicago neurobiologist, Dr. Peggy Mason, who shared her research on the biological basis for empathy at the faculty roundtable on science and religion held at the Quad Club two Wednesdays ago here on campus. This past Tuesday, I preached and presented to a group of clergy in Indiana at the Wabash College on environmental justice. My lecture titled, How to Love Your Neighbor When Their Neighborhood is Killing Them. And then on Friday, I attended the 27th Bell and Joseph Braun Memorial Symposium at the University of Illinois at Chicago's Law School. The symposium titled, environmental justice and human rights in the Americas and the Caribbean. It was during that symposium on environmental justice and human rights that this sermon was inspired. Or shall I say that I was inspired while I intended the symposium. How glad you asked. <laughs> Stay tuned. Today's scripture is a typical scripture for this season because it is about giving thanks. And I want to give you a little meat to chew on with your turkey this Thanksgiving or whatever it is that you eat. You know the story, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem when he passes through a certain region and comes upon 10 men with leprosy. Leprosy encompassed a variety of visible skin dis disorders and even included withered limbs, physical disorders for all to see. And because of these disorders, these men were ostracized and they were outcast. Whenever they walked down the street and saw people, they had to announce themselves by saying, unclean, unclean. And the people would stay a distance away or scatter as if they didn't already stay away due to the visible signs of illness. Let's not move quickly through this story. I want you to get a sense for this society in the text. The society that seems to embrace fear mongering, othering, and shaming. I know it sounds a bit like today, but let's stay with the text. The society in the biblical sacred text today is a society that marginalizes those who are different and even those who are not well. And that sacrifices their well-being even more by requiring them to announce that they are unclean as they move about the town. What do I mean by sacrificing themselves? Again, I'm glad you asked. This is society, the one in the sacred text that sacrifices the mental health and overall well-being of those with leprosy so others can be protected. Imagine if you had to walk down the street and announce your ailments, those that others thought were contagious, to protect them from you. Imagine if you had to announce your comings and your goings, risk embarrassment and isolation and therefore your mental and social well-being so that others could avoid you. 
The society, the one in the text, would sacrifice you for the good of others. You see, I learned about sacrifice zones during the symposium on human rights, where people are harmed by pollution and the exploitation of their land, their health and their very lives are sacrificed, if you will, for, for the so-called greater good of what the polluting company produces. An atrocity that is happening today around the world and even in our city, state, and country. It's the same principle carried out in the society of the sacred text that those with leprosy, their well-being is sacrificed for the good of those who do not have leprosy. A terrible way to live and in this story, 10 men were living in this predicament, crying out, unclean, all part of their own sacrifice zone until they saw the one who could make them clean. And when they saw Jesus, instead of crying out unclean, they cried out, Jesus, have mercy on us. I love that us. Jesus tells them to go and show themselves to the priest, which is what you customarily did after you were made well or made clean and healed from leprosy. The ten obey Jesus, and as they walk in faith together, they are healed together. And then something happens. The scripture says, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at the feet, giving Jesus thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Out of the ten with leprosy who were all healed, only one came back and said thank you. What is truly the difference between the nine who didn't come back and the one who did? Well, the first is that the nine were Jews and one was a Samaritan. Jesus later calls him a foreigner. This is significant because according to one commentary, there was significant conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans. Samaritans were considered heretics for they worshiped God differently and, and considered half-breeds because they married non-Jews. And because of this, in the mainstream society, they were ostracized and they were outcasts. So the one, the one who came back had been a double outcast, once because he had leprosy and again because he was a Samaritan and he returned to give thanks. Verse 17, Jesus says, were not ten made clean? So where are the other nine? Did none of them return to give glory to God except this foreigner? Then, then he said to him, get up. Go on your way. Your faith has made you well. And I'm sure by this point you think you know where the sermon's going, that my sermon title, Be the One, reveals that I want to teach you to be like the one who came back and gave thanks. If God has been good to you, has done something for you, don't, don't just take God's goodness for granted and, and keep on stepping like the nine who did not turn back, but be willing to separate yourself from the crowd and be like the one who, in verse 15, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, he prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. I know some of you thought Reverend Veronica's going to tell us to be like the one and come praise God loudly. She, she's been wanting us to speak up. She's going to use the text today to tell us it's now time to, to give God thanks with a loud voice. Now all of that would preach, Pastor Sarah and, and Emily, it would preach well, but, but being like the Samaritan and giving thanks is hopefully by now Christianity 101. That, that really the bare minimum of what we should know to do, I mean, mama and grandma taught us to say thank you. Some of us, granddaddy taught us, or Uncle Joe taught us, somebody in our lives have taught us to say thank you. I have a confession to make. I find people perk up when you say you're going to confess. 
And it's actually that that's what I had imagined preaching when I titled the sermon, Be the One. Elikum can attest to it. We had a little conversation. So Elikum, I'm going to point out the one. The one that turned back, but that was before Friday when I attended the symposium on human rights. You see, I sat there astonished by human rights violations around the world and the spirit said, your sermon title is right. Be the one, but the one you're going to lift up on Sunday is not the Samaritan. The one Christians really need to be like is Jesus. And someone needs to know the day that God is still speaking and God will continue to speak until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Let's go back to the text and literally see what Jesus does. Verse 14 says, when Jesus saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. First, Jesus sees them, all of them. Jesus sees the 10 men with the skin disease and Jesus surely notices that one of them was a Samaritan for he acknowledges it later. And Jesus not only sees them, but Jesus hears their cry for mercy and responded to their request, treating all of them the same. He doesn't single out the Jews nor the Samaritan for preferential treatment. He doesn't pull the Samaritan aside and say, you know, you don't get the same treatment as they do. Sorry. Jesus heals these men and ends this horrific period in their life. They no longer have to walk around saying unclean, announcing their arrival and participating in their own humiliation. And that's just who Jesus is and what Jesus does. Jesus liberates those who are the most embarrassed and ostracized in our society. Jesus liberates those in society who are isolated and avoided because of their skin. Jesus heals and liberates those who get the side eye from everybody else in society. Jesus healed these men and set them free from that which kept them apart from their loved ones. They cried out for mercy and Jesus saw them and set them free. And I know only one came back, but he's not the one this society needs us to emulate today. Jesus is the one, be the one, oh Christians, who actually pays attention to Jesus. I know Thursday is Thanksgiving and only one came back to say thanks and we need to do the same. And if that's the message, you need it today. Here you go. When God's mercy and grace has touched your life, humble yourself and say thank you. Realize the favor and the mercy and grace on your life. And with gratitude, with a grateful heart, say thank you, God. Be the one who says thanks and be the one to be more like Jesus. Let's go back to the text to see other ways to be the one. Jesus heals all ten and one comes back and Jesus says, where were, were not ten made clean? So where are the other nine? Did none of them return to give glory to God except this foreigner, the one named Jesus, shows interest in those who did not return. And if the one, stay with me, was a foreigner, what does that make the other nine? They were natives. So while Jesus asked, where are the nine, this Thanksgiving, I hear Jesus saying in my spirit, where are the natives? You see, Jesus did not let it pass that the nine were nowhere to be found. He asked, where are they? He acknowledges that the one who came back was a foreigner, but where are the nine? Where are the natives? Let me be very clear. I am not saying that Native Americans need to say thank you for anything. The parallel that I'm drawing, like the nine had been isolated, left out and harmed, and were no longer seen. 
It's a human rights conundrum that in the USA, the indigenous people are rarely present, rarely at the table, and most of us know nothing about them, including where they are. And many of us don't care. Jesus noticed the absence of other human beings when he said, where are the nine? Jesus cared for all who were injured and harmed and sacrificed. And as a follower of Christ, that compels me to say, where are the native people of this land? How are they doing? What do they need? I know that sounds foreign to you. It sounds foreign for me to say it. But someone has to be the one who thinks outside the box of human rights acknowledges past and current atrocities and be the change that they hope to see in the world. Thank you, Mother Teresa. And on this Sunday before Thanksgiving, we're gonna be the ones who give honor to and express concern for the indigenous people of this land. I believe that's the least that Jesus would do. So let's begin with a land acknowledgement, and Hyde Park Union has heard this before, written by Symphony Fletcher of the Pritzker School of Medicine, candidate 2024. Please repeat after me if you so are willing. We are standing, we are standing. And, worshiping and worshiping on the land, on the land. Of, the Peoria, of the Peoria, Miami, Miami Kickapoo, Kickapoo, and Potawatomi Nation. And I will add from, there's a website, native-land.ca, and you can find out the lands that you stand on. And so it also included the Achiti Sakawin, hard to say. Say it with me, Achiti Sakawin, and the Kaskasia Nations. Keep repeating after me, these lands were the home of these native nations prior to their forced removal and relocation. Prior to their forced removal and relocation. These lands, these lands continue, to be continue to be embedded with the rich histories, with the rich histories and struggles for, survival the struggles for survival of each nation. Jesus cares. Jesus, who cares about all people and understands sociology and history and the human condition better than anyone. In this sacred text about giving thanks, ask the question, where are they? Where are the indigenous of this land? According to an article on native land by Reverend Stephanie Perdue, of the Cherokee Nation and also Associate Conference Minister of the Illinois Conference, United Church of Christ. 40% of Americans believe that there are no native people left in the US today. The Native American population in 2020 census stands at 3.7 million, up from 2.9 million in 2010. Somebody say they're still here. But for much of the American public, it would be more comfortable, I'm still quoting Dr. Perdue, to believe that there are no Indians anymore. And she called them Indians. She's, she is Cherokee, and she, she informed me that, that many still use that term, Indian. She says, land acknowledgments have the potential to disrupt that comfort. See, we like to believe that, yeah, that happened, but that's not the reason America became what America is. Oh, yes, it is. Land acknowledgments have the potential, again, I say, to disrupt that comfort and to teach us a more accurate history, but they fall short. Don't think you're doing something if you just start doing a land acknowledgement. She says they fall short on those goals if their process is not thorough and their articulation focuses only on the past. Jesus asked, where are the nine? And by pointing out that the one who came back was a foreigner, in essence, Jesus was asking, where are the natives? Now, of course, those natives in scripture had something for which to give thanks. But the Native Americans are entering a time of lament. 
Thanksgiving for many Native Americans is considered a national day of mourning. And as we enter as Christians this week, preparing to give thanks for all that God has done for us, let us take time to reflect on those who are native to this land. Those who mourn on the day we celebrate. Let us be the one who does not let that day pass without realizing that harm was done and is still done to a people who owned the land and took care, better care, of the land. It won't hurt you to reflect on the pain that was caused. It won't kill you to think about the story that was cleaned up by U.S. history books. Someone has to be the one who refuses to sweep injustices under the rug and continue to perpetuate lies. Can you be the one today? Someone has to be the one who thinks that sacrifice zones are asinine and inhumane. Will you be the one today? Someone has to be the one to acknowledge that the comforts that we claim today would not even be possible without the harm that was done and the land that was stripped. Will you be the one today on this Sunday before Thanksgiving? I'm grateful for Jesus and for the example he continuously sets for humanity, an example and a standard for Christians to pay attention to, not just simply look for the fruit from Jesus, but to be part of the fruit of Jesus. In this country that is so very divided, if we all pay attention to Jesus, See, when you read scripture, you have the opportunity to identify with any character in the text. When, when the woman with the issue of blood touched Jesus' hem, by the name, I heard her name is Veronica. Look it up, that's true. At least that's what scholars say. Do I identify with Veronica? Or do I pay attention to Jesus who liberated this woman who was ostracized? and left to die. We have that opportunity, identify with whoever you want, but if you call yourself Christians, do yourself a favor and please also check out Jesus. Someone is asking, why do I need to be the one? John 15, 16, Jesus says, you did not choose me, I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will remain. And while I was sitting there listening to the wonderful singers, this, this thought that I think Dr. King shared, I wrote it on my bulletin, and it is that the atrocities that are easily perpetuated happen when good people who know better do and say nothing. So this Thanksgiving, be the one who sees people and their condition and asks questions like Jesus did and gets involved. Be the one who stands for human rights. I know the opportunity will present itself. Be the one who takes up for the one being bullied and you might just help avoid a catastrophe. Be the one who volunteers to serve in the food pantry. We especially need help during the holidays. Be the one who writes or calls your elected officials and express your concerns about modern day sacrifice zones. Be the one who helps the stranger. Be the one who sees the homeless and asks why in 2022 have we not figured out this problem. There are a multitude of ways to be the one. Give God thanks and praise that you have the privilege to be the one who can speak up on behalf of somebody else. This Thanksgiving, and I'm going to take my seat as you give thanks to God. Thank God for Jesus. I used to hear the elders say that. 
I thank God for Jesus and I didn't understand it, but now I do. Resolve in your heart to be the Christian who actually strives to be more and more like Jesus. Be the one who has concern for humanity, concern for the human condition, and do something about it. Be the one. God bless you.